the next reader is actually someone who was uh, sent by Robert two years ago, the so-called younger generation, Roger Van Poole. It's, uh, it's so amazing to be in this theater with the lights on. Uh, you know, when, when Michael was talking about the, the kind of blankness of, of the paper between the kind of bende dots, was it? It was like a cartoon. Yeah, I just thought, oh, hey, this is my mom, and dad, dad's up there. He's kind of turned off right now, but you know, anyway. <laughs> so the, uh, I retitled my talk, and uh, I've decided to call it uh, Agent Kelly and All That Is the Case. <laughs> I'd like to begin my talk by recounting to you the strange and curious case of a certain personage by name of Lusions, first name unknown. Like Kafka's friend in creation, that mischievous, elusive assemblage of personality, <coughs> junk and thread, Odradek, Mr. Lusions is totally harmless, possibly not real, and beyond that, quite possibly even more real than real. This much we know for sure. Mr. Lusions is a writer of letters, though to whom they are addressed is, and will more likely than not remain, a complete blank in these proliferating drawers and files. We also know that what he writes is beyond his agency and cannot be uttered, nor can it be understood in the language of the waking. And yet of all writing that occurs, his is perhaps the most present to us, too close perhaps for us ever to catch a view of it. It take, takes place in that much wider current of conspiracies, of namings and identifications, which transpire to dupe us day in, day out, the underwriter of which can only be can only be summed up by the word blankness. Now, let us investigate what associations might draw themselves around this character. Since we have only evidence of his name, and no one to speak of has in fact ever encountered this, I can't quite call him person, beyond the uncertain scope of a dream, we are compelled to work with what we have, which is none other than the spelling of his name. Following this course, the most obvious and clearly traced list would proceed as follows, elusion, illusion, collusion, and so on, the list certainly not terminating there, but for our purposes not in fact needing to go any further at this time. Rather than continue with this charade, I will now fess up and explain to you that our Mr. Lusions is in fact a character from a dream, reported to me by my close friend and fellow student Alana Siegel. The counterpart to Mr. Lusions does, in fact, walk, act, and behave in this waking world we now occupy. A kind of agent, you might say, insofar as the word agent goes back to the Latin root for doing. Agent, one who does. Miss Siegel explained to me that in her dream, Robert was writing a letter, and that she could not read the body of the letter, but that it remained with her after waking up that he had curiously signed, in place of his name, Robert Kelly, the name Lusions at the end. I had, I had, previous to hearing this uncanny account, assembled a number of notes for this talk, and found it to be a perfectly advantageous coincidence from which to dive into the course I outlined for today. The first observation, for which I first and foremost owe oh, thanks to the intelligence of Miss Siegel's dream life, is that language and its fundamental existence between an I and a you, like a letter, underwrites the mind's experience of the outside world. And the outside world is nothing other than the individual's body, colonized, as it were, by so many names and identifications. There is the image of Robert writing a letter in the dream. <coughs> Through his having signed the letter Lusions, it is not only called to the attention that the actual writing is an illusion, but that he himself, as the author of it, is equally illusory, and furthermore in collusion, that is, complicit with the illusory, but only insofar as the very fact of the illusion is to be uncloaked, in which case she has been notified and disillusioned of the illusion itself. In such a situation, the illusion becomes a particular, an exception among others. To see it as such is to have come out from under its spell, as Robert writes in his poem, Sentence, till the door wakes up from its dream of passage. 
So by inspection of the illusion, there is gained again the possibility of the world, dwelt with as it doubles itself over and turns, bringing up a multiplicity of moments and occasions, accumulating particulars even as they too are called into question, doubted, and world is refigured. This wandering, this eluding, and turning from one exception, one moment, one particular to another, this perpetual summation is, first of all, crucial to how we move away from what we know into a becoming of what we do not know. And it is furthermore a crucial dynamic in the unfolding of a poem made by Robert Kelly. As the mathematician Henri Poincaré, in a chapter entitled The Selection of Facts, states, as soon as the rule is well established, as soon as it is no longer in doubt, the facts which are in complete conformity with it lose their interest, since they teach us nothing new. Then it is the exception which becomes important. We cease to look for resemblances and apply ourselves before all else to differences. Yes, Agent Kelly susses out the differences. Which brings me to the first line of the poem I wish to speak of. The first line of the sequential poem sentence is, Star contriving stars, the words. From star singular, the line shifts to a plurality of stars. The tendency here is from the eidetic fundament, or the essential, to the multiple, the concept to the example, the rule to the exception, the abstract to the particular. This calls to mind a sort of slogan I learned from Robert, which he related to a class I was in via pound, and which went something like this. The man from the east goes down the ladder. The man from the west goes up the ladder. The eastern mind concerns itself with the worldly particulars of the earth, while the westerner, on the other hand, rises into abstractions. Robert's poem sentence seems to achieve both approaches at once. The latter is among the most original symbols of invention. It seems fitting that both the investigative slash particular and conceptual slash abstract approaches to the world are, in that image, related to the latter, as if to say it is through invention that world is conceived. Recently, the image of the latter came up again while I was drifting through W.A. Budge's translation of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. I fell upon a section concerning the latter to heaven and was surprised to discover that even the great Osiris had no other passage to heaven but by way of the latter. Even gods make use of the invention, the latter, implement of gradation and measure as a means of transport between earth and paradise. To carry the image further, it is worth noting that the latter's scale, for obvious reasons, is always in direct proportion to the body. Sentence is very much similar to the latter in this way, as the poem calls us to relate to the world through a connection between mind and body. Poincaré, elsewhere in his writings, also reminds us that it is with the body that we take measure of the world. Physically, this poem moves up and down simultaneously, an effect achieved by the layering of unfinished phrases together in a continuity. In the space of reading, this means that content is gathered forwards and backwards and up and down this very ladder-like poem. In the time of reading, this means that the past, present, and future are not so much fused together in the so-called moment, but are allowed to collide and bump into and fracture one another in a process of shifting recombination, analogous to geologic movement. Time, as a surface in the poem, can be described as Jean Dubuffet once described a flint. Nowhere in its mass is its texture even or homogeneous. It is entirely capricious throughout. The lines skip over and bypass the channels through which ordinary syntax would lead them to a summary meaning or content. Or, in the words of the poem, if a work ends with its meaning, it doesn't mean. And yet we arrive at this paradox. The very proposition of the poem is that, after all, this is a sentence, a complete thought. Therefore, we are also compelled to regard it as a whole, of a piece, a continuity. Before I go any further, I think it would be useful to point out some purely topical details of the form of sentence. First off, the lines of the poem are grouped together in quatrains, and the poem itself is in four sections. The next feature of the poem's topos is that, despite its title, which would lead one to expect words and thoughts neatly arranged with commas 
into phrases and onwards to a sentence, the 14-page poem has, save for a single exclamation point, which is a mark of sheerly gestural expression, all but one punctuation mark, a period at the end of the last line. This extends Apollinaire's revolutionary gesture of removing the punctuation from his great poem, Zone, by which he invited chance into the picture, into an investigation of chance as a form and law unto itself, chance as structure, this now brings me from Poincaré to another mathematician in his lineage, Max Dane, who besides being known among artists for his having taught at Black Mountain, was a seminal figure in his work towards the development of topology. In an article on Dane's work, David Pfeiffer explains topology like this. Topology can be thought of as rubber sheet geometry. One is allowed to stretch and deform the shape as long as the shape is not torn or cut. The distance between points is not important, as it is in geometry. Two shapes that can be deformed into each other are considered equivalent, the same. I propose that from one point of view, sentence can be seen much in the way de Buffet describes his flint, splintered, discontinuous, self and self-interrupting, capricious even. Seen another way, it is a folding and morphing of one continuous sheet of language, its semantic gaps continuous with the places where language has taken form as content. A poem all of a piece, a manifold of time bent and twisted into its various locutions and cumulative meanings, a topology. Out of the tension between these two possibilities, we arrive at a form of reading in which the poem clarifies and intensifies the immediate fact that each reading and rereading is, in reality, a particular occasion, an exception to what is already known and remembered. The poem manages to maintain its status as a sentence, that is, a complete thought, while all the while perpetually undermining and evacuating its own laws and orders. Thus it remains always a becoming of the unknown, a line of flight that does not travel, an instacy. This undermining quality, this self-sabotage, gives rise to some curious effects. First of all, it creates a form of wandering that is pure wandering, a wandering which does not go anywhere. In an elaboration of the nature of flight, of fleeing, Deleuze speaks of the nomads as people who, in the strict geographical sense, are neither migrants nor travelers, but on the contrary, those who do not move, who are immobile with big strides, following a line, a line of flight on the spot. The poem's sentence places itself smack in the center of this curiously immobile flight, this apt evocation seen from one sight only, says the poem. Early in the poem, there are repeated references to marriage, as if the poem were a wandering marriage of elements. I rove for my pleasure, my pleasure to marry, the poem sings. Then, eventually, the poem contradicts itself. Even this last time unmakes a marriage. This permission the poem takes to contradict, to betray itself, to turn itself back on its own narratives and meanings, often even interrupting itself in the middle of a phrase, is what allows it to continue to be a place of making, a fountain of moments, marriages, and particulars. In a short piece entitled Aztec Definitions, Jerome Rothenberg writes, what's to be done when the shape of the real falls apart? If not to curse life, then to sense that life returned to chaos is returned to the possibility of new thought and goes on in discussion of the Aztecs' curious response after the devastation of Spanish conquest. Perhaps it only happened then, when they were powerless, but more likely, from the work, they had welcomed it. This need to preserve the potency of the real by a regular overturning and remaking of primary beliefs. Deleuze speaks of a similar process of self-contradiction in his description of the line of flight. To flee, not exactly to travel, or even more, there is always betrayal in a line of flight, betrayal like that of a simple man who no longer has any past or future. Sentence is in part an attempted release, or even flight of, form from the self-duplicating precincts of history. A chance, Kelly writes, to liberate the form from history and hear it. In a similar spirit, Morton Feldman wrote in Anxiety and Art, 
For 10 years of my life, I worked in an environment committed to neither the past nor the future. What we did was not in protest against the past. To rebel against history is to still be a part of it. We were simply not concerned with historical processes. We were concerned with sound itself, and sound does not know its history. This attempt to withdraw language into pure form is the last recourse there is towards the re-engineering of history. This time, in accordance with, in terms of, uh, yeah. this time in, accord in terms of the poem, uh, uh, <clears throat> sound itself, and in terms of the poem's social surround, n uh, ooh, shit, forget <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just pick up again right now. Make it up. <laughs> In discussing his idea of passionate attraction, Charles Fourier proclaims, My theory confines itself to utilizing the passions now condemned, just as nature has given them to us, and without in any way changing them. That is the whole mystery, the whole secret of the calculus of passionate attraction. In its utopian reach, the poem sentence is orchestrated according to the principle Fourier dubbed passionate attraction. Fourier had it that, far from seeking out uniformity in society, what we should be looking for is a system that embraces the systolic drive of difference and natural conflict, a system that brings extremes into close proximity and utilizes discourse as a form of energy in the pursuit of convivial pleasure. As writes Robert in Sentence, a suavity of conflicting purposes only apparently, to believe everything, do everything, until the lust opens and becomes shaped like her, but made of justice and augmenting light specific arguments. Fourier would describe the previously mentioned process of betrayal and contradiction in terms of what he designated as the tenth of the thirteen passions, namely the Kabbalist passion. The Kabbalist, Fourier writes, is the passion that, like love, has the property of confounding ranks, drawing superiors and inferiors closer to each other. It is the passion that undermines, which keeps a set of rules from becoming too firmly entrenched. In its slithering manner of lines transgressing the normative syntax through which words and phrases string together into communications and meanings, the poem sentence very much operates according to the undermining principle of the Kabbalist passion. The poem argues for the absolute pursuit of the mind's urges, and also for the maintenance of the yet-to-be-imagined, maintaining the space of the imagination's becoming as sacred. As is written in the poem, Find the middle sea and kill no more, necessary paradise of the unimagined, till love and labor is one rapt analysis. Thanks. Thank you.